Hi, everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Beatles News Briefs, your home for the latest real clear Beatles news and information. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and here's the latest Beatles news. A George Harrison interview of Michael Jackson, thought to have been lost, was rediscovered by the BBC this week. The interview, taped before Jackson released his Off the Wall album in the 70s, talked about how Motown refused to let him write his own music, and Harrison talked about what it was like to work in the same band as Lennon and McCartney. Excerpts were to be featured on the BBC this weekend. The full interview has been on YouTube, but in very poor fidelity. Visitors to Paul McCartney's website earlier this week got a surprise when they found the Deluxe Red Rose Speedway box selling on Amazon currently for $172, available for only $34.98. The box sold out very quickly, not surprisingly. There is no explanation from his reps why the unannounced flash sale. Rogue Best uh, put out the word that a new Pete Best album will be announced soon. We'll give you more information when it's available. Pete's last album, Heyman's Green, was released in 2008. A new release of outtakes from Magical Mystery Tour are coming from the bootlegger HMC according to a preview video that came out this week. The Consumer Technology Association launched a new video series called Studio Stories Quality Sounds Matter that features a special homage to Jeff Emmerich with an extended cut of his final interview, and it's in high-res audio. You can find it at www.cta.tech slash consumer dash resources slash guides and then click on high res audio. We'll post the, the link on our Beatles news and information page on Facebook. And Guy Webster, a rock photographer who shot numerous album covers, music, musicians, and even U.S. presidents, has died. His album covers included The Doors' debut album, The Birds' Turn, 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 Barry Maguire's Eva Destruction, The Stones' big hits Wild High Tide and Green Grass, The Mamas and Papas' Deliver, The Mamas and Papas' first album, the one with the toilet on the cover, Simon and Garfunkel's Sounds of Silence, Van Dyke Park's Song Cycle, and Paul Revere and the Raiders' Midnight Ride and Just Like Us. His individual photo subjects included Ravi Shankar and Harry Nilsson. We did an obituary on him that you can find on Variety.com and search for Guy Webster or my name. Some chart positions from the Billboard issue of February 9th. On the Billboard 200 at 159, up from 173 is Abbey Road. And that album changed positions with the White Album, which is now at 173, down from 161 last week. On the Artist 100 at number 78 is The Beatles down from 65 last week. Top album sales 58 down from 50 is The White Album. 62 up from 76 is Abbey Road. And the continual up down up down of Egypt Station continues this week. It's number 31 up from 97 last week after being 37 the previous week and 88 the week before. Talk about a seesaw trip. Anyway, catalog albums, number 43, at 43 up from 49 is Abbey Road, 48 down from 42 is the White Album. Vinyl at 10 up from 15 is Abbey Road. Top rock albums, 29 up 35 is Abbey Road. Uh, 32 down from 31 is the White Album, and 35 up from 38 is the Beatles 1. So today being February 9th, we have a special extra for you. Uh, Candy Leonard, Beatle News Briefs contributing editor and also the author of Beatleness, and myself discuss our personal memories of the week the Beatles arrived in America and debuted on The Ed Sullivan Show. Here's Candy and me. I'm here with Candy Leonard, author of Beetleness. Actually, that's only a partial title. Please. The full title is Beetleness, How the Beatles and Their Fans Remade the World. Okay, thank you. And this is 
probably one of the best occasions to talk about it because we're in the middle of the anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America and the Ed Sullivan Show, which is also a big day for me because personally because my son was born on February 9th, which is kind of cool. Yeah. But anyway, let's talk about the Beatles. What a great idea. How did we know that we were going to do this? We did talk about the the prelude to this on the earlier show with Al Sussman. Now that they've arrived at the airport, people are screaming, you know, and everybody's going nuts all over the place and the media is going crazy. What has happened in the in the interim between then and now? <laughs> Going back, going back to 64. I well, mean, I mean, you know, I think the uh, famous footage of the press conference, which is really kind of delightful and weird to watch, <laughs> considering, you know, where did 55 years go? But um, I cannot say with certainty that I even remember watching that at the time. Um, I know I've watched it countless times since. But, I mean, the real, you know, one of the things I say in the book about that press conference was that, their quote unquote performance there, which wasn't really a performance because that's really who they were. They were just authentically being themselves. But in many ways, that little press conference and the way that went was just as important, I think, for their ultimate reception and, and the way they were greeted in America as the Sullivan show two days later, because the press you know, they, they were sort of, you know, somewhat cynical and, you know, didn't really have high expectations and they were expecting right. stars to be kind of, you know, maybe not too bright and maybe a little deferential to the press, but they were none of those things. They were extremely bright and not at all deferential. Well, and, and I, yeah, and I was listening to the press conference recently uh, and I was, I mean, they really didn't know how to, how to deal with them. I mean, they, in a way they dealt with them the way they dealt with a lot of, younger celebrities because they asked him really stupid questions right but you they know. were i think they were kind of um disarmed and charmed by the way the beatles responded right, right. Know, they, yeah. it was just like they developed a rapport with them um that really you know lasted for many years you know where you know where, where it started in that press conference honestly it started before it even began because when they when people were I guess people were standing or something at the beginning and somebody and, and Murray the K, I guess, was standing and somebody told Murray to cut that cut it out. And mm -hmm. Paul, Paul, you can hear Paul saying, Murray, cut that crap out. Go ahead, Murray. Tell Murray to cut that crap out. Cut that crap out. Cut that crap out. Hey, Murray. Is that a question? Yeah. And yeah. I think that was the, really kind of the beginning of the whole thing. It was really kind of funny. That, yeah, it was almost a way of sort of commenting on the absurdity that everybody in that room was engaged in at that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. It, it, really, it really was. Let me ask a question. The press conference was just so engaging as far as they were concerned. It really kind of sets up the characters that we yeah, that came, to, came to know. Right. As the as the Beatles, and that was really kind of the the cool part of that. And then we fast forward to February 9th. Right, um, with so much anticipation, and uh, well, of course, the rec. You know, we've been listening to "I Want to Hold Your Hand" for over a month by that point, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people knew what they looked like at that point, even if they hadn't seen the press conference. So. There was an enormous amount of anticipation, and there was also an awful lot of hype too. Yes, there was a lot of hype. Um, that's true, but I think we should be careful. I, mean, I don't think. I mean, I, who knows what would have happened had there been no hype? But um, certainly, the, by that point, Capital recognized that you know they had something very valuable here, and they started investing in some hype. But um, you know, when you hear people fans talk about, um, you know, how that experience of watching that broadcast really changed their life. I mean, it sounds like hyperbole, but I mean, one of the motivations for me to even write this, uh, to write Beatles was that, you know, I've gotten to conversations with people all my life about the Beatles and this recurring thing about how that, you know, just seeing them meeting, you know, meeting the Beatles and, 
what happened the next day in school and on the playground and and how it was just this kind of, um, you know, fresh gust of wind, of energy or whatever, you know, that that came into their lives that was really profound. Mm -hmm. And not only did uh, not only was there capital, but there were also, you know, there was also VJ. There was also, you know, the other the other labels that that tried to cash in, too. So. So, yeah. And of course, they, you know, they, it was three weeks in a row that they were on. And so if you were unfortunate enough to miss the one on the ninth, you, you know, and everybody's talking about it, suddenly you're shut out of the conversation, right? Like everybody's mm-hmm. talking about them. And so, you know, I remember people, I didn't know what it was. And then, you know, they, remember that you know the next week they were sure to watch it and and then of course the one after that so you got this kind of really concentrated dose you know this like blast of beetles in that month of february mm-hmm. and it was really you know people say it was transformative and you know in talking to fans not only informally my whole life but when i was researching the book i you know, I, I, there were some consistent threads that I heard about, you know, how it changed their lives, you know. And, and if you really stop and look at it, it, it was truly, a, it was really a remarkable thing. They became a focal point for, you know, millions and millions of um, baby boomers. And, and I always have to say this, that, um, you know, we think of it all as teenage girls, but in fact, a lot of these early fans um, were children, you know, under 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, how, how did you how did you first hear about him? I know that in my case, I think I was in seventh grade. I guess. That, yeah. Seventh, that would, right. would have been about, about I was right. in second grade and that's five years. So, yeah, that sounds about right. When I was in seventh grade, they divided our class up into separate groups and I was in one group and my best friend was in another group. And I don't remember, I mean, this was kind of a, you know, a scholarly thing or a competition thing. I don't remember exactly what it was, but in any event, they named their group, the Beatles. And I said, why are you naming their group? The beer naming your group, the Beatles. And he said, you haven't heard of the Beatles. <laughs> and I, and I honest to God, I had not at that, at that point. And that was before they, before February 7th or 9th. Right. Mm-hmm. And so he and he explained who they were. He said, oh, there's these great this great group from England. And I went, oh, OK. And I started listening. And then I found out all my other my all my friends were listening. And I went, oh, my God. And I got and I got into it. And they were playing it. You know, they were playing them very heavily on on uh, in Boston on WBZ and WMEX. And uh, and in fact, WM, WBZ was getting imports parlophone imports from england because they were playing they played i remember they played beatles for sale before anybody else you know before we heard some of those songs you know so um but but yeah that's how that's how it happened and then of course when i was when on that night our whole family was in our family room and and my sister and i were right up in front of the television and my mom and dad were in the back of the room and so we were all sitting there watching this watching this show and I remember my dad not liking them. He, he didn't like their hair. Oh, well, that was a consistent theme. I mean, right. dads in general did not like them. And, you know, as the weeks went by and Beatlemania really took hold throughout America, the, the dads became more and more sort of anti beetle Right. And the moms, I mean, several fans told me they said it was, you know, the moms liked them, but had to kind of not let on to dad that, you know, (laughs) they became this presence in in the home, you know. Well, here's here's what happened. The funny thing is that, number one, of all of us in the family, he was the one who got physically closer to them than any of us because he was a repairman for Sears Roebuck. At the time, and he was in downtown Boston. And while he was there, their motorcade passed him. <laughs> and he came home and he told us, and we were all so jealous. 
funny. You know, because because they wouldn't let us go see him. Well, see, that's just like even if you didn't like them, like your your dad recognized that there was something special about them, and the fact right. that he saw their motor motorcade go by, you know. Right. Especially, right. you know, even if you, even you know the adults who didn't like them, there was something about them that just kind of, you know, they were charming. That you just sort of got a kick out of them. But I think the reason the dads didn't like them was because of the hair. And again, I was looking at the video today, and you know, their hair at the press conference and on Ed Sullivan on the ninth was was by today's standards so unremarkable, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's really astounding to think about the furor that their hair caused and, and how that was all anybody talked about. And, right. and people and, you know, as far as, you know, fathers, you know, that, that their whole, uh, even though, as I say, they thought they were interesting or charming even, but they, but they really didn't like the hair because I, I think it, it was seen as a threat, you know, because the last thing you wanted as a father of a son in 1964 was to have your kid be a nonconformist. And of course, as the decade wore on, this, these battles over hair length became more and more fraught. You know, remember, and that, remember the scene in I Want to Hold Your Hand where the dad drags the kid to the barbershop? Well, this really happened. I mean, right. this really happened. And, and I, you know, some of the people I, the guys I interviewed, like to this day, they, they still, I mean, the parents are long gone but they still remember the indignity of being dragged to the barbershop you know that, I mean? yeah, that didn't i don't think that happened to me because uh i mean they wouldn't i i didn't go anywhere near you know a beetle haircut but there was no question that i wasn't going to get one so but the other funny thing that happened is in regards to my family was that when the rolling stones came along a few months later, my dad's feelings turned toward the Beatles because <laughs> here, right. here were these threatening, these ugly looking Bruce guys right. versus the nice looking Beatles. Right. right. And I and that I and mean, you have to wonder if that happened a lot, too. Well, I think, as we know, the the uh, the stones were purposefully, explicitly marketed that way. Right. And I think that it was. I think that your your father's response was actually not unusual because it's like parents at some point resigned themselves to the Beatles and all right, well we're gonna have to live with this until it wears off. But then when the stones came, it's like, oh God, now this? So yeah, so by contrast, you know, the Beatles seemed much more much safer. Mm-hmm. Let me ask one question. Okay. I mean, I because I just gave my personal story. Oh, what okay. happened what happened with you? I can't remember when I first heard of them or like when they first entered my consciousness. I I can't say. I'm guessing it was probably right before the broadcast on the 9th. Mm -hmm. I mean, mean that day, but like in maybe the weeks before, because we had and, you know, one of the things about being a Beatle fan, it was something that you did with siblings and neighbors and fan, you know, it was like very much a a social thing. And so I had a friend downstairs whose older brother was all into the music, so he's a bit older. And so we knew all the hits of like 63 and all that. And I think he probably told us about the Beatles and maybe played I want to hold your hand, but I can't. I re, I do remember the the first Sullivan broadcast and the excitement afterwards. I I I can remember shortly after that getting Beatle cards, and at this that point I still didn't know. I couldn't name them all. I mean, I was seven mm-hmm. years old. You know, this all happened. Where, very quickly. where was this? Is Queens, that, New York. Were you listening to WMCA or WABC? Yeah. Or WMCA? yeah. Absolutely. Which, well, my which, father was. I which did. One? Yeah. Hmm? Which one were you listening to? Oh, because you'd go back and forth, you know, between. Okay. Well, um, at that time, Winds, I think, was not all news yet. So it was, um, yeah, you'd go back and forth between ABC and um, WMCA, you know, or WA Beetle C, as they were calling right. Right. But yeah, I remember trying to learn their names. And, you know, I think that and this I believe this is probably still true that Paul and Ringo are in some sense visually the most distinguished, you know, the most Mm -hmm. different looking. 
for various reasons. So people, and I think this, like I said, when I think this is true, I think this was true with my grandsons. They, you know, you, you learn Paul and, and Ringo first and George and John, you kind of, you know, take a little longer, to, which is so funny to think about that now. But yeah, it, it was a very big deal. I mean, I remember walking up to the store to, you know, to get a magazine and, you know, we watched all three. I remember that. And, um, I don't know. It was, there was something exciting about it. It was just, I mean, I remember it as this feeling of ex, of like just exuberance, excitement. There was something new and fresh about it. And, mm-hmm. and I also remember as a kid, and this, you know, I talk about this in the preface of Beatleness, is that even though I was very young, I got the sense that there was something really strange about this, you know, like, People were, I mean, the level of reaction, not only among kids, you know, but like everywhere. And, you know, they were on every magazine, every news, you know, like, like some, we, I had, I feel like I, I was witnessing something really extraordinary. Was, yeah. um, when I, I, I was living in New Jersey for a while, I think you, I think you know that. And while I was there, uh, this was after 1964, so. But while I was there, um, WABC was the station that my, was in with my friends. Mm-hmm. Although we did listen to WMCA a little bit and WINS, but WABC was the station that most everybody that I knew. Listened well, it's also the stronger signal. Oh, okay, okay. I hadn't. I had. I forgot about that. Yeah, you're right. Actually, it was. It was. But in any in any event. But another thing too that you know that. Um, we probably should mention is that the interesting uh, another interesting thing about that Sullivan show is who was on it besides right. them and right. that was Davy jo- Davy Jones um, who later went on to bigger and better things and okay. and and I talked to him about that in my book see I'm mm-hmm. gonna plug my I'm gonna plug my book now go ahead uh, meet a monkey Davy Jones and and right. that was a, a you know he was he was a big fan um, I know there were there was controversy later when he made a remark about manufa- Beatles being manufactured, and there was a lot of reaction to it. But he, you know, he count he countered that when I talked to him and said, "No, no, no, I didn't mean it th- negatively at all. That he was that he actually liked them a lot." So, but that was, uh, you know, that was amazing uh, that uh, that Davy Jones was there. Right. But there was, there was something, you know, it was I don't, ironic isn't the word, but it's it's just like an interesting thing, like this, con- you know, that that their paths crossed at that moment, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, but um, but that whole those whole you know few days from the arrival to the Sullivan show and then and then on to Washington. I mean. Well, the whole month was really, you know, I mean, it, it 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 like burst and it stayed in this kind of burst state for a month. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, you know, the uh, the number of events, the number of things that happened to them in that first month was just absolutely crazy, you know. Yeah, I mean, their lives changed too, obviously. Um, everything changed, you know, and and I you know that sounds like hyperbole and oh everything changed what does that really mean but it was a it was very disruptive you know it was it was very disruptive in in the way that that term is used now and kind of a more positive sense of you know disrupting kind of something old and stale and you know disrupting it with something new and innovative and exciting and and that's obviously very much what it was and we could talk about it all day we could. And we thank you, Candy, for talking with me about this and going through this. And we will do this again, I think. And in five short years, we'll be celebrating the 60th of this. Oh, my God. Kind of, which is kind of um, daunting. You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that is a little daunting. Um, let's hope we're all around for that. Yes. Anyway. anyway. Hey, I'm planning to be around for the uh, for the 100th. You're planning to be around for the hundredth. I hope I am yeah. too. Hope I, I am too. I'm okay. Lots of kale and exercising, and I plan to be around. I'm 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 not eating kale, but I am exercising. I You'll am. fill me out on the stage to uh, recollect. <laughs> okay, Candy, <laughs> take right. care. Take care. Bye. On this day in history, on February 9th, nineteen sixty-one, the Beatles made their first appearance at the Cavern at an un- unadvertised lunch show. 
On February 9, 1964, the Beatles debuted on The Ed Sullivan Show, the first of three appearances. Also on the stage that night was future monkey Davy Jones, who sang a song from the Broadway show Oliver. This was, of course, the week the Beatles arrived in America. Asked if they were worried about the trip, George Harrison told Disc Weekly, My only problem is wondering how I'm going to pack all my baggage into the 66-pound allowance. That's it for now. You can ch- catch our shows on fab4radio.com. Thanks, Matt. Beatlesarama.com. Thank you, Pat. And also on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world, and check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people. And that's also where you can find links for both my book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, and Candy's Beatleness. Look for our next show, and please subscribe. We'd love to have you with us. And I also want to put in a plug for my Abbey Road Beatles page message board called the Toppermost of the Poppermost on Pro Boards. The URL is abbeyroad.proboards.com. If you have uh, Tapatalk, the, the app can get it from there as well. It's full of Beatles discussion and Beatle topics and, and polls and all sorts of fun stuff. And we'd love to have you there. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying, Be seeing you. that one market fab